All right, part two, chapter 15. We finished part one with talking about different factors that really need to be determined for or should be determined for um, treatment with antimicrobial drugs in terms of what pathogen are you treating, what should be the dose, um, what's the length of the treatment, things like that. Um, and a lot of work has been done over the last almost 100 years looking at bacterial, cytal drugs, micro static drugs. Um, but, you know, while those are very effective, there can be some drawbacks. And these are the two major drawbacks here on this slide. The first is that bacteria can kill normal microbiota, right, your normal flora. I mentioned that with the idea of of um, narrow spectrum versus wide spectrum drugs. All right, and then also I mentioned this, uh, the next fact in lecture, when we are looking at endotoxin, what endotoxin actually does. When you kill bacteria, that causes the cell to be disrupted. And in terms of endotoxin or LPS, the toxin, that endotoxin, is part of the cell wall. So when you kill off a bunch of gram-negative bacteria, then you're actually releasing that endotoxin into the body. And it can be released at very high levels. And in reality, that could actually become deadly. And so there are some factors that you need to look at. And all right, as far as drug safety, there's what's called the therapeutic index. And the therapeutic index is a ratio of the amount that can be tolerated or the safe dose to the minimum effective dose. So you actually want your therapeutic index to be high. That means that a person's body can tolerate a high dose, but actually only needs a small dose to be therapeutic, to be effective. And so maybe that number is say 50 to 1, all right, your body can, can tolerate a dose of 50, but you only need a dose of 1 to get rid of the infection. Whereas if you had a low therapeutic index, your body can tolerate 10, but you actually need 10 to get rid of the infection, all right, that's borderline of actually being safe. Now, Antimicrobial drugs are grouped based on their cell target, and this table of the different cell targets is divided in half. And um, the first major target is cell wall synthesis. All right, these are generally bacteria-focused and kill the bacteria, all right, because if you destroy that bacteria wall, then that cell is going to be open to lysis, osmotic factors. Um, and our cells don't have cell walls, so it's very easy to target cell walls and not target our own cells. And you see a, um, a bunch of different drug families and then different examples. And you don't need to know these, but rather understand that cell wall synthesis is a target. And those that we talk about um, specifically with the drug families. We'll talk about a few of those in class. All right, another, another target is nucleic acid, usually bactericidal, because if you destroy the nucleic acid, then you destroy um, everything within the cell. All right, the cell can no longer make proteins. It cannot go through metabolic processes. All right, the second part of that table is... Um, Folic acid synthesis, this is sometimes referred to as um, metabolic pathways or enzyme pathways. Um, but this is um, one major group of drugs, the sulfa drugs, sulfonamides. And this is broad spectrum because it does target this entire process. And with folic acid synthesis, bacteria have to make their own. And... Um, our bodies, our human bodies, we don't make folic acid. We actually have to ingest the material, all right? And so you can target folic acid synthesis 
as a metabolic process and specifically target bacteria, but not humans. Uh, and then protein synthesis is also a big category. And if you remember from probably closer to the start of the semester, we talked about how the ribosomes <coughs> are different between eukaryotic and prokaryotic. Um, and so that is why we can target protein synthesis and um, still be safe for human consumption. They're not going to alter human metabolic processes. However, if, it, if you are targeting protein synthesis, you just stop that protein synthesis. The cell has um, the proteins that are already completed, already made, and so those proteins that are already present can still allow for a proper functioning of the cell. And so that is why protein synthesis um, targets are generally bacteria static. It just stops the bacteria. It doesn't allow them to continue to grow for maybe a couple, maybe one or two generations, but not very long. All right, and then <clears throat> the cell membrane, also bactericidal. You disrupt that membrane you inhibit the ability of that cell to regulate what goes in and out. So those are the major categories, typically five major categories. This is a um, diagram from another textbook. I kind of liked it. I like it better than what's in your textbook. Um, but you have the major categories. All right, folic acid synthesis right here. The nucleic acid, whether it's DNA or RNA the cell membrane, the cell wall, and then protein synthesis. And there are a variety of ways that the protein synthesis can actually be blocked. Um, it can target the 50S subunit, the 30S subunit, or block the actual pathway in which, you know, this process is working. All right, so this is a schematic of that of table 15.1. All right, your five major groups of targets. All right, but with specifically looking at cell wall synthesis, this is most effective during exponential growth phase. So if you recall the growth curve of bacteria, you have the log phase, the exponential or log phase growth, and the stationary and death phase. During that exponential phase, that is where cells are actively building their cell wall. And if you disrupt that process, those cells are not going to form. And um, this is what's happening, all right? With this cell wall, there are these different sugar chains, all right? They are the, considered the NAM and NAG um, subunits. They are different subunits. They get connected by different enzymes different components that allow for peptide bridges to be made. And it's basically like a scaffolding around a building where you have all of the different layers, you have the bars, you have the wood planks that allow for builders to stand and be safe. But if you disrupt any part of that, then you leave, you alter the integrity of the cell wall. All right, so what penicillin does is it actually blocks the ability of these peptides to form crosslinks. And then you end up with, even though you might have all of these subunits, they're not connected. And so it's very weak. You end up with holes in the cell, and the cell wall falls apart, and then you just have this garbage appearance down here. And this is one of my favorite pictures um, that I pulled from somewhere, and it's a, basically a before and after penicillin picture. All right, here you have this bacteria that is, or maybe not a bacteria, um, almost looks like a parasitic worm. But you add penicillin, and it could be a spirochete or spirillium. You've got this nice, vivid white color. That cell wall is intact, very solid. Now you have penicillin, all right, after penicillin, and you don't see that integrity it almost looks like the background. And so what's happening is this cell wall is falling apart and the interior of that cell is not functional. 
right? But there's quite a bit of different drugs that target the cell wall, and a big group is the beta-lactams. And the beta-lactams block cell wall construction, and what it does is it um, prevents those cross-linkings within the peptidyl glycan to form, and you end up with the holes. All right, so the different groups of beta-lactam drugs are the penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and the monobactams. All right, and these drugs all have these beta-lactam rings. That's why they're called beta-lactam antimicrobials. So the beta-lactam ring is consistent between the groups, but then all of the different side groups are slightly different. All right, then the sulfa drugs are antifolate drugs, so that the cell is no longer able to produce folic acid. Folic acid is important for DNA, nucleic acid construction. And um, that is why folic acid during pregnancy is so important, because for new cells to be made, formed, you need a lot of folic acid for that DNA activity. And with um, pregnancy, you have that unborn child, that fetus, the embryo that is inside of you. And those cellular um, division or the cellular process of always adding and dividing cells, you need a huge amount of DNA. And that is so that's why pregnancy requires a lot of folic acid. All right, um, the sulfa drugs, um, bacteria static. All right, and the mode of, it's a broad spectrum of action. This is going to target all of this folic acid production. All right, it doesn't matter what type of bacteria cell it is, it's going to target um, that process. So very broad spectrum. All right, and then there's the proteins, all right, whether they bind the 50S subunit, the macrolids, lincosamines, form phenical, or the 30S subunits, tetracyclines, aminoglycosides, all right, this is going to disrupt protein synthesis. And recall that that is bacteria static. It just stops the cells at that point. It doesn't necessarily kill them. They just can't do a whole lot more. All right, the cell membrane, uh, polymyxin and polymyxin E, or B and E, these are narrow spectrum. They only interact with a few types of bacteria, um, primarily gram-negative, and it's going to destabilize the outer membrane. And um, unfortunately, though, there is a narrow therapeutic index. So you actually have to take, well, the dose that you can take safely is very equivalent to the dose that is needed to actually be therapeutic. And this drug can actually cause a lot of damage to a person. And so taking these drugs is going to be a last resort. And this is what happens. All right, the polymyxin actually interacts with the LPS molecule, and in that way it allows the polymyxin to interrupt or interact with the poly with the phospholipids in that cell membrane and actually create holes in the membrane. All right, real quick with drugs targeting viruses. Um, viruses are hard because they don't have metabolic processes. Eukaryotic pathogens, problematic because they're eukaryotic just like we are, so it's harder to find differences between a eukaryotic pathogen and your own eukaryotic cells. So with antiviral drugs, there are five main groups that can be targeted. And that is specifically with um, the activity of the virus, right? Attachment, penetration, uncoding, viral replication and assembly, and viral release. These are the main processes within viral replication, and so those can all be targeted. There's also a sixth category of drugs that are the interferons. <coughs> and this actually stimulates the immune response, doesn't actually negatively um, alter the virus itself, but rather stimulates the immune response to increase its own effort in trying to clear the um, virus infection. 